They're calling him the literary find of the year, and he certainly has an advance to prove it. His book is headed for the big time as it makes it to international bestseller lists. But what sort of story has he written, and what is he himself like? Those are just two of the many questions I hope I'll have answered as I introduce you to Hari Kunzru. Welcome to the program, Hari. Thank you for having me here. Pleasure. Now, you know, the interesting thing is most of the time when people talk of your book, they begin by talking about the whopping advance you've got. Are you beginning to be very irritated with that? Well. As a writer, obviously, I prefer that the discussion was purely on artistic matters, but I accept that the situation is such that uh, it's a publishing industry story and we live in a world where people are very interested in money and so it's, you know, it's a burden I have to bear. In fact, to be honest, a million dollars or whatever really sounds like a fantastic sum for a first book. Were you surprised by its success? Well, I suppose I should clarify that the, the sum I got is actually for a two-book deal and uh, so, you know, Contrary to popular rumour, I, I, still, I still have to do a fair bit of work to earn all this money. But I, I was extremely well paid. It's, it's, it's very unusual for a literary novel to receive the kind of advance that I did get. And, and no one was more surprised about that than me. You know, they keep calling it your debut, but again, you've done two others before this which never really saw the light of day. Well, you know, this is the great, great fallacy about uh, the first novel. Virtually every first novelist, you see, has the guilty secret that they've been trying to write for a long time. And in my case, I'm 32 years old now. I've always wanted to write fiction. And there are two manuscripts gathering dust in the proverbial bottom drawer, neither of which I think deserve to see the light of day. I'm very glad that this is the first thing that I've, I've shown to the world. So, but, you know, everybody has to train. Everybody has to practice. You said in one of your interviews that if, in fact, the Impressionist hadn't been bought by a publisher, you were seriously considering giving up fiction altogether. Oh, yes, I was going to join the French Foreign Legion. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, there, there comes a point, I think, where you, you, know, you, have, to, you have to accept that maybe you don't have talent or maybe things aren't going to work out for you. And, um, you know, I really felt I put my soul into this book. It's a book I cared about a lot. And uh, I felt that if people didn't want to know about this, then maybe that I should... Uh, more or less gracefully accept that I should be doing something else with my life. So there is a touch of romanticism. You were literally at sort of mental breaking point and you end up with one of the biggest deals ever for a first book. Well, yes. I mean, it's a fairy tale story. I mean, I, I suppose I was... Um, I, I think most of the trouble that, that novelists find, certainly before anybody's actually given them any encouragement, is this whole business. It's such an absurd thing to do. I mean, there you are, you're sitting in your room writing away, telling a story that you're not sure anyone else will find any connection with at all and you know it, and the, the battle is mostly psychological it's a question of actually keeping the faith with yourself and gritting your teeth when when you're faced with indifference so yes it's, it's extraordinary and uh, you know I, I give thanks for that let's talk about the book it's theme in a sense is not belonging or what the reviews have called oddness as well as the desire to be accepted to what extent is this a reflection not of your own life but the emotions and sentiments and feelings you must have felt as you were growing up in England. Well, absolutely. I think that you, you always write about yourself, whether, whether or not on the surface the, the details of uh, your, your text are actually autobiographical or not. And with me, the, I grew up in suburban London in a, a relatively wealthy white suburb, with son of an uh, Indian father and an English mother. And, and was very acutely aware of a kind of dislocation from my surroundings. For one reason or another, I, was, I, I never really uh, fitted into the place where I grew up and never felt comfortable there. And also, I have a, a large extended family in India, and I've, I would occasionally, you know, once every year or two, come over and visit here, but never would feel more English than uh, when I was in India. So that, that, that sense of not quite fitting any of the available categories was a very um, early emotional feeling and it's always interested me you know the, the whole question of margins and boundaries and the blurring of boundaries has always interested me does the book go a little further is it also in a sense a catharsis view is it a coming to terms of the two bits inside you the indian and the british um, I, I would have to say yes to some extent i mean that whole uh, project of, of spending several years really thinking about colonial history thinking about the history that had brought my own life about was was something that i'd wanted to do for a long time it's a real luxury to have that time to to, to meditate on your own origins and actually uh, 
ask yourself some of the questions that had, you know, ask myself some of these questions that had been floating around for a long time. Whether it's a complete catharsis, I, I doubt. I mean, no, I, I, I don't think you ever come to the kind of end point of your... You also searching. have to save something for the second volume. Absolutely. <laughs> Key. <laughs> you know, one of the most striking things about this book is its erudition. There are pages where it's absolutely crammed with learning. Did you spend hours beavering in the British Library to do your research? Luckily, the, I am a, a library nerd. I mean, I, I, I enjoy research. I always have done. And there's, a, there's a, another, another excuse for writing the book was this, this uh, wonderful collection in the British Library, which is the India and Oriental Office collection, which comprises both the administrative records of a couple of hundred years of running the empire and also the personal papers of many, many people. So once you've worked out their arcane filing system, there's a whole treasure trove of stuff. I was able to pull up boxes of party invitations from Bombay in the 1920s, of uh, personal diaries, of letters and photographs. And so, you know, again, it, being able to dive into that archive was fantastic. So it was a pleasure. Much of your understanding of what the British were like when they were ruling their social mores and their customs and their practices, not to mention their prejudices, actually comes from first-hand research into their personal archives. Absolutely, yes. Um, I, you know, I was very struck, actually, while I was doing the research. You know, I think I grew up with the standard version of colonial history that you get as a, as a, 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 in a liberal education in Britain nowadays, which is a certain sort of rather foot-shuffling, nostalgic guilt. Uh, and you know, it's not, it's not polite to look too closely at what the British did in India because it's generally felt to have not been altogether a good thing, funnily enough. And, um, and I wanted to understand the motivations of the people who would, who would go several thousand miles away and have the arrogance to believe that it was possible for them to control such a vast area of, of space. And the more I found out about these people, the more I found out about their beliefs, um, the more I kind of grew to understand what drove them, the ideological reasons, the religious convictions, and so on. And I found, if not exactly a sympathy, then the degree of under understanding. Yes. And I, I mean, I think that was very helpful for, for me, because I think you get a crude, quite a crude understanding from both sides of the, of the fence of colonial history. Now, the book's met with extravagant praise, but it's also had its fair share of criticism. One of the more intriguing comments is that it's too brilliant to be truly moving. Well, at least, at least it's been called brilliant. Um, I mean, I, I think actually you know, this partly stems from the fact that what I've written isn't really a realist novel. My intention isn't particularly to, to, to tease out the, the psychological subtleties of personal relationships and so on. In a way, it's a, it's a picaresque. It's, it's a kind of moral journey with a hapless hero going through a number of quite unusual... And one and who keeps changing his identity. I mean, who keeps changing his identity. He goes through these as emblematic situations which brings him into contact with a lot of the contradictions of uh, colonialism, race, identity, and so on. And um, I'm not too bothered by the fact that it, it hasn't got this sort of psychological uh, verite to it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm fine with brilliance. But what about the corollary, which is that you may enjoy the book, you may get to the end of it and like it and admire the writing, but you don't really sometimes care, they say, about what happens to the central character, Prom. Well, it's a, the central character is, is, he's almost like an anti-character. He's, he's the character with no character. I mean, I've, I've described my book in the past to people as like a donut. He's like a, a, a sweet with an absent center to it. Because this, this guy, he's born into a wealthy, high-caste Hindu family at the beginning of the century. And his whole identity is stripped away from him. And he actually undergoes quite terrible abuse in the early stages of the book. And one, one of the truths about that is that people can bury their own feelings. People, people really do make themselves psychologically unavailable to themselves. So he drifts through the rest of the book as a kind of absence, as somebody who's unwilling to interrogate his own feelings and who wants to just blend in with whatever the context he finds himself in. So his very absence, his very lack of affect, uh, is, is, is part of the stuff that I'm really trying to deal with in this. I mean, my sense of my own story is that after the end of the book, when he goes through a kind of moment of uh, kind of cathartic collapse of the rather false identity that he's built up, that after that he will have the possibility to make a psychologically deep understanding of his own life and that perhaps if you know if a reader were to be able to read beyond the end they would they would have an understanding of this guy but it's, it's there because he's not available to himself and he's not doing that work of understanding himself so i, I accept that criticism completely. you're doing more than accept you're actually turning the criticism on its head because what you're really suggesting is that if people cared about pran 
But then Pran would not have worked. Well, what I wanted, didn't want to do was to write the tragic story of a young boy who can't find a home, and you know, this you you could you could have the violins yeah. playing. That would be pathetic. Have, exactly, and I didn't want to have a straightforwardly sympathetic character. One of the things about um, the, the figure of the mixed race individual is it's always a troubling figure. It's always an ambiguous figure. It's a figure that troubles categories, and. Um, he should not be morally perfect. He should not be the sort of character that you sympathize with and you understand his plight in every respect. In my book, this, this guy does some quite unpleasant things and he's certainly opportunistic and he's, you know, he's, uh, he's a chancer. And uh, so I wanted to have that sort of flickering, uh, maybe a slight distaste around him. So I, I'm not bothered by that criticism at all. The book, of course, is going to be sold and read in its millions in all sorts of different languages. What sort of response are you getting from people who perhaps don't understand the half-caste nature of this particular character? Well, I've, I've had some extraordinary conversations with journalists from different parts of the world. Um, I remember, I mean, far, far and away in advance of any of, the, any of the other rude questions I've been asked by anybody, <laughs> is, a, is a conversation I had with a Polish journalist who asked through a, an interpreter, whether I prefer to have sexual intercourse with black or white women, and whether, uh, when I, I explained to him that I, I found this line of questioning somewhat offensive, he seemed, he seemed quite stunned that I could, I could find that, and, and, and said that he personally had not had the experience of sex with a black woman, and he thought his readers would be interested to find out, and so I, I suggested that he would maybe like to leave at that <laughs> point. <laughs> but you know, inherent in that story is one of the pitfalls of becoming a major best-selling author, and that's the fact that people treat you as a sort of public intellectual. Does that daunt you, the fact that you're going to be asked weighty questions and people will listen with deep attention to your views? I, th I think, you know, the, the temptation to set yourself up as an oracle is, is great at this point because people will, they'll, they'll sit there with their notebooks and they'll write down every belch and fart of opinion <laughs> that you have, whether it's uh, valid or not. And my, my hope is that I will, you know, I'll say sensible things about things that I actually have something sensible to say. Um, and when you don't, you won't? And I think that's, that's the time when you, you keep quiet and you, you know, you say, I have nothing to say on this But subject. is it easy to shut up when you're successful? Well, I, I don't find it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> you're in India, obviously, to promote the book. You're also half Indian. Would a good reception in this country mean a lot? Of course it would. I mean, I, you know, I, I have a strong connection to India. I have family here. Um, you know, I, I feel so warm that I am getting this amount of uh, attention from, from Indian people and, and the Indian media. I mean, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a question of my kind of bridging these two quite sort of distant countries which have produced me. So, yes, I, I, I would be very happy to get a good response here. But suppose I were to say to you that even during the first half of the book when Pran is in India, and particularly when he's in fact believes that he's Indian, the voice that speaks to you sounds Western rather than Indian. Is that deliberate or would that be the score? Well, I suppose, I suppose that's my voice then. I mean, if that's, if that's the sense you get, then that's very interesting to me. I mean, I, I've, I've lived all my life in, in London and, and in, the, in the UK, and I, I suppose that my formation has in many ways been a Western formation. And so the voice telling this story is more or less, it's more or less my voice, and if that's the sense that an Indian reader has, then so be it. Harry, let's take a break, then come back in part two and talk a little bit more about the voice, or rather, let's talk a bit more about you. Okay. We'll be back in a couple of moments. Don't go away. Welcome back. My guest is author Harry Kunzru. Let's talk about you. Your father's Indian, your mother English, which in your own rather wonderful phrase makes you a blacky white. What sort of childhood did you have as you grew up in Norman Tebbit country in the 70s and 80s? Well, there was such a disjunction between my home life and, and the world outside the house. I mean, my, my parents were fantastic. I mean, they're very loving, very close. And, uh, and then, then there was, a, you know, I think, I think the world of a child and a teenager is always quite a violent world in, 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 in a way that adults forget. Children are cruel to each other, and especially where I grew up, there was a kind of undercurrent of Oh, there was an undercurrent of racism, I think, frankly, that's, that's the only word that you can say about it. And Norman Tebbit country was not a great place to be growing up as a young Asian boy, and I was never really allowed to forget that I was a Paki. And that, that certainly, that wounded me 
a lot at the time, and I think it took a long time to work through the sense of anger that that gave me. You know, as you said, you grew up a child of two cultures. Were you ever confused about who you were or where you belonged? Um, I don't think the question ever framed itself quite like that, because the, for me, for me I, I mean, it seemed clear that I was from where I was from. I lived in a house in such and such a place. I walked to school in such and such a place. I, I, I'd lived there all my life. So and you felt British, just like anyone well, I, I felt like myself. But that's different from feeling British. Certainly when the people who are defining what it means to be British are people like Tebet and Thatcher, who seem to think that you had to conform to some bizarre faux 1950s idea of what Britishness meant. And I didn't, I didn't understand their version of Britishness. And if that was the only one going, then no, I wasn't British. So what was I? The question that always came up was, where are you from? And I'd say, I'm from Woodford. Uh, and people say, no, where are you from? And uh, you, it's a very confusing thing, the idea of this infinite recess behind, behind where you're from now. Were you from somewhere else before? I know it's an unfair question and I ought not to ask it, but let me try it on you. If you had to ask yourself as a seven or eight year old the Norman Tebbit cricket test, what would you have answered? <laughs> That's a very difficult one. I mean, the straight answer is I'm not a cricket fan. Terrible thing to say <laughs> in the Indian media, but I'm not a special cricket fan. But the the, as a seven or eight year old, I, I wouldn't have known. I probably would have said England, I would have thought. But England versus India, I remember, I remember Sunil Gavaskar was a hero of mine when I was a, a cricketing, cricketing kind of a kid. But the point, the point was that, is that forcing people to make that choice was one of the most disgusting things those politicians could have done. The idea that you had to in some way abandon your heritage and your, your own complex sense of yourself in order to be allowed to be in Britain is an appalling thing and that's something that I, I will never forget and I will never really forgive those politicians for. You said that you were always a packy in the eyes of people in school. Well, you some people in school. You really. also said in your interviews that that made you a lot more competitive and determined to prove that you were better. But in a sense, as you succeeded in school, did it make things easier or did it simply re-emphasize the difference? Well, it always annoys people if you do well, doesn't it? And um, I mean, I was the kind of, um, I was the kind of slightly cocky little boy who, who was, go, who was probably, I probably would have got grief whether I was a Indian or not, but... Um, a little bit of a geezer, were you? I was a little bit of a geezer, exactly. And, um, you know, what, I mean, what happened was I, I became competitive in order, you know, in order to get away from those people. And, and by the age of 18, I managed to remove myself from the whole situation by going to university somewhere else. Well, and, you did uh, exceptionally well, didn't you? Because you not only got a first at Oxford, but in fact you were shortlisted for an All Souls Fellowship. A yeah, narrow escape there. <laughs> you mean you're not sorry you never got the fellowship? I'm actually, in retrospect, I'm really not, because I, I mean, at the time, it was something I wanted. I could imagine no higher honour than being elected to this very sort of elite society of scholars. But actually, if I, you know, if I think about what would have happened to me, I would have been mouldering away in my ivory tower and would have had very, very little connection with where I think the real kind of cultural interest in, certainly in Britain is. I mean, in, in the end, what I did instead was go to, to London, spend a lot of time doing minimum wage jobs and being on the dole while trying to write. And I saw a lot more of life and had a much better education, I think, than I, I would have done had I stayed in the university. So where along the line did your fascination for writing really begin? Um, I think I, I started taking it seriously at about the age of 20. At university I hung around with a theatre crowd and I was convinced that I was going to be a a great theatre director. I mean, this consisted of smoking filterless cigarettes and, and wearing a, a cap and talking loudly in the theatre bar at, at college. And uh, I mean, this, this rather sort of silly sense of myself as a, as a theatrical person was really overtaken by a sense that what I wanted, what I loved most of all was, was language. And I, when I realised that I was never actually more content with myself in the world than when I was doing minute work on a sentence, that's when I realized that's what I had to do. In fact, you're very true when you say that you love language because it's love of language that comes through in your book. Do you spend a lot of time crafting the language or does it just flow the first time? Definitely doesn't flow the first time. I mean, I, I'm a child of the word processor age in a way. I mean, I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to compose a novel longhand and when every alteration would involve crossing out or pasting stuff over. Um, find and replace, being able to kind of pick up one word and move it somewhere else in a paragraph, all that stuff is fantastic to me, to be able to work over and over and over again until you hear the, the prose in your head. So how did a person like this end up as music critic 
for wallpaper and wire. <laughs> I mean, there are very few people who get shortlisted for All Souls Fellowship and are music critics in the pop world. <laughs> Well, I, I've always I've always been a fan. This is the thing. I've always been a music fan. And uh, when I realised that if all you had to do was to write a little music review and people would start sending me free CDs, what better thing could have could possibly happen to me? So it's a it's a shameless way of keeping keeping my music collection up to scratch. I love the idea that I can have half a dozen new things to listen to every few days. You know, listening to you talk about your life, I get the feeling that perhaps your greatest strength is your belief in yourself. It must have been very important to you in those years between 20 when you began writing and now when the book's been published and you found that what you were doing wasn't worth coming out with. I think you have to be bloody minded to some degree. I mean, that's, that's the quality that anybody making art of any kind needs because, you know, you're putting yourself outside the conventional forms of success. I mean, you know, granted, you know, I, I got paid in the end, but that was never never certain, never even likely. And I think you have to, you have, to have a core of self-belief in order to do that at all. I mean, it's a, it's a mad project. It's insanity. And what about things like discipline and dedication? I mean, does one have to be very disciplined when you keep saying to yourself, God knows if this will work, God knows if it's even worth doing? I mean, there's, there's the myth of the writer is this sort of inspired moment where, you know, the pen starts to flow and, uh, you know, the muse is speaking. But actually, it's 90% perspiration. The people who actually make novels make a career at writing novels are the kind of people who will sit down every day whether they feel like it or not and produce 500 or a thousand words and that's how you have to do it the ideas are part of it but it is it is the and not having enough dedication to do that at least certainly i'm the kind of writer who can't work all all day in a concentrated way by six o'clock i'm itching to get out of my chair and run out and meet friends <laughs> Odd you should say that because your friends say that he's a solitary person. He likes to be by I himself. I wonder whether that's, uh, that's them pulling my leg or your leg. Um, I, I do like to be by myself, actually. I do need, I, need a, I need a core of time every day where I'm inside my head and I am doing this, doing this work that's very, very kind of wrapped up in my own concerns at the time. But at the same time, I think I'm a quite a social kind of a writer, certainly compared to your classic sort of recluse in the country. I, I like the city. I like, I like to go to parties. Do you like, like people's friends. company? I do, yes. In which case, the Jane Austen question. You're 32 or 33. You're a rich man. Are you mm. now in want of a wife? Well, this is, this is, a, this is a, a huge question. I'm certainly in a position to get married now, whereas I wouldn't have made much of a match before. You make it sound like an economic arrangement. <laughs> well, is it, is, is it not in traditional Indian society? <laughs> So are you looking for an arranged marriage? Will the family during this visit find someone suitable? I'm sure if my aunties have their way that will happen, but I'm not sure I'm going to let them. <laughs> You're going to retain that little bit of independence? Absolutely. Harry Kondro, a pleasure getting to know you. Nice to meet you too. Yeah.